Hello and welcome. We're excited to see so many of you join us here today for the live webinar, Facial Aesthetic Complications, Using Ultrasound to Dissolve Fillers and Reverse Vascular Occlusions. You're among over 2,200 plastic surgeons, nurses, and medical aesthetic clinicians who registered for today's popular event. Thanks for joining us from all corners of the world. I think we're all happy to see the increasing popularity of dermal fillers in recent years. And I think it's fair to say that we're also seeing increased concerns over the associated risks with so many danger zones for vascular occlusions in the face. Not to worry, in minutes, we'll be joined by two global renowned facial plastic surgeons who are defining today's best practices for using ultrasound to avoid and treat complications by using high definition imaging. Doctors Steven Weiner and Stella Desietnikova will teach us proven imaging techniques to rapidly and accurately dissolve fillers under ultrasound guidance. You'll learn common scanning techniques proven to deliver predictable and safe patient outcomes. We'll even have live scanning today to see fillers under high definition ultrasound live. But before we introduce you to your expert speakers, it's my pleasure first to welcome your host. Dr. Oran Frankel is trained in emergency medicine in California, has been using point of care ultrasound his entire career, and is a passionate POCUS educator. He now practices in a busy academic teaching hospital in Vancouver as an emergency physician. Dr. Frankel also serves as chairman of our Claris Medical Advisory Board. Welcome, Dr. Frankel. Thanks, Janice. It's good to be back. And today's topic is, I love this job because I get to learn so much on the fringe of what my knowledge was on point of care ultrasound and all these uh, new and important evolving considerations. And today's topic on facial aesthetic complications is one of those. Uh, we wanted to kind of set the stage for our discussion on some of the research that's been done in the background on why today's topic is so important. The first paper we picked up was a review about complications after cosmetic fillers, um, how to prevent them and how to manage them. And we all know that soft tissue fillers are a mainstay now in contemporary and minimally invasive facial rejuvenation clinics. Uh, and the, they provide timely results with a minimal recovery period but they're not without risk. And as these procedures increase in their use, we're also seeing increase in complications, which can range from mild superficial skin irregularities to granulomas to the dreaded vascular occlusion with skin necrosis and even blindness. And serious adverse events can be avoided with safe injection techniques and early recognition of symptoms, but it also requires a thorough knowledge of local anatomy, particularly the vascular anatomy. And we think that to minimize the risk of vascular occlusions in these procedures, practitioners really need a detailed knowledge of the three-dimensional anatomy of the area that's being treated. And they also need to understand the distribution and depth of the vessels for the target area and the possible variations that their patients may present in all of these. What to do when there is vascular occlusion is an evolving area of research. And with its increasing use of the, the injections, it's no surprise that the incidence of complications is increasing. The incidence of necrosis related to injection of collagen has been reported at nine in 100,000 cases, and 50% of those are in the glabella region. And for dermal fillers, the incidence is about one in 100,000 cases. But it's widely recognized that although the incidence of vascular occlusions following injection of soft tissue is increasing, we do think it's might be likely to increasing popularity of these procedures and potentially being done by less experienced practitioners. And in this internet-based survey uh, by 52 experienced injectors worldwide, 62% reported one or more intravascular events. And it's likely that this is even underreported and that the incidence could be significantly higher because people are not reporting into any kind of database about the complications they're experiencing. So before we get on, and just to show that everyone's kind of in the same realm together, we kind of want to see you chip in and answer anonymously to these questions. What challenges do you find concerning or questions that have come up in your clinical practice when you're performing dermal fillers? Despite a keen knowledge of anatomy, have you experienced that vascular structures have a high degree of variability? Have you encountered the question, when is a bruise just a bruise, or is it a sign of a vascular occlusion? When is a patient, when a patient is not responding to hyaluronidase, for a nodule, why aren't they? Are you sure maybe that you have the right diagnosis? Is the swelling around a patient's eye related to filler or is it possibly fat prolapse? And when you're placing a filler in the piriform, are you sure of the level of the angular artery? And how about when the superficial temporal artery, when you're volumizing the temple, do you know where that is? 
We'll give you a couple seconds to answer and just see where everyone shakes out here. Okay, we'll go ahead and close the poll. Yeah, so pretty far spread. Everyone appreciates that vascular structures have a high degree of variability thanks to everybody responding and it's really across the board. These are challenging clinical questions to answer with just your clinical exam alone. And that's why we're so grateful to kind of delve deeper into this topic of using ultrasound, particularly to improve the safety of filler treatments and then later to treat vascular uh, occlusions. And you know, we know that there's a evolving literature around using ultrasound to improve the safety of these procedures and such that before a filler treatment is performed with ultrasound, previous filler treatments can be identified. You can do vascular mapping in the area. And then if uh, there's complications such as dislocation, abscesses, or even vascular adverse events can all be seen with high resolution ultrasound. And then using the ultrasound to guide the injection or treatment can really rapidly help and help focus the treatment. So to address this first topic, using ultrasound to dissolve fillers and reverse vascular occlusions, we're going to jump into first the, the first segment of dissolving fillers. And we can't think of anyone better than to bring back Dr. Stephen Weiner, who is a board certified head, neck, and facial plastic surgeon. After graduating from UCLA, he completed medical school at University of Michigan, interned and spent his residency at Johns Hopkins, where he became an instructor for two years in the Department of Head and Neck Surgery and Facial Plastic Surgery. Dr. Weiner established his private practice in Thomasville, Georgia with great success for 10 years before envisioning the future of cosmetic procedures as non-surgical. In 2005, he laid down his scalpel, concentrating 100% of his efforts in non-invasive and minimally invasive cosmetic procedures by founding the Aesthetic Clinique. Dr. Weiner maintains an extensive lecturing and teaching schedule. He's a frequent speaker at international conferences in Europe, Asia, Australia, and South America. Dr. Weiner is one of the top physician trainers for Galderma and participates in their Train the Trainer programs. He's been invited to several advisory boards, including Galderma, Revance, Lutronix, Saniva, and Allergan. His areas of expertise are acne scar revision, fillers using blunt microcannulas, ultrasound of the face, and RF microneedling. Dr. Weiner, over to you. Well, thank you, Oran. And I want to thank Clarius for inviting me to speak again. This is my second uh, webinar with them. So I'm a facial plastic surgeon, and I'm located in uh, Santa Rosa Beach, Florida. And it, so the first thing you need to know is what do fillers look like before you can treat their complications? So this, so the most common filler, obviously, is hyaluronic acid filler. And you see with the arrow what hyaluronic acid fillers look like. They're called anechoic. Anechoic means black. Black because the sound waves travel directly through them, almost like fluid. Okay, fluid also appears black. Over time, occasionally they become less black and they something called hypoechoic, which is a little dark shade of gray. They will have something called posterior enhancement, which I'll go through in, in a later slide. And sometimes they look like spheres, sometimes they look like ovals, and sometimes they look like marquee diamonds. Oftentimes, whether you inject with needle or cannula, they kind of look the same. So let's go to the next slide here. So this is an example of HA in the preauricular area, in the submalar area, you also call it. And you can see there's uh, several pockets of HA. And then just below the HA is the parotid gland, okay? So that's the parotid gland right here. And the parotid gland is gonna be a lighter gray. And then actually anterior to that is the masseter, which is gonna be a, uh, rather dark because it's filled with a lot of blood. Uh, all muscles are pretty dark. So that's what HA appears to like uh, on, uh, which looks normal. So here's another example of HA, and this was bolused onto the zygomatic area, the zygoma, and it stays there for two years or longer. So the common thinking that uh, HAs stay for approximately nine to 12 or 15 months is not exactly true. We are seeing HA lasts a lot longer by ultrasound, particularly in the periocular uh, ocular area, I'm sorry. So this is just an example. It's actually my wife's example of the piriform area and the um, angular artery. On the left side, you see that angular artery actually along the periosteum, which happens in about 1% of the cases. So ultrasound is extremely useful to avoid complications as well as treating complications. 
And in this case, uh, I avoided a major complication by not treating that deep piriform space uh, with the needle on the periosteum. So on the right side, you see a typical uh, angular artery with the HA product deep to it. So there are some variations in how HA products look, and I'm beginning to see the differences, and I'm, I'm going to be writing this up soon. But there's another product called RHA3 from Revance, and you see that their pockets of HA don't appear as spherical or as round as other uh, HAs do. And that's because of uh, the way they're cross-linked and the way they're manufactured. So all the HA products don't behave the same way. So one thing that is kind of a fallacy that I want to get rid of is uh, when you're injecting down on the periosteum in certain areas, this is onto the uh, mandible. The HA product does not stay on the mandible, on, on periosteum. So here's the HA, here's the HA, here's the HA. So what happens is twofold. One is the muscular structures are constantly moving and they move that HA product that once was on the periosteum into an intramuscular injection. So you see that often in the mandible and the masseter, but also in the temple. And I'm gonna show you uh, that as well. Um, but also when you're injecting with needle, oftentimes the HA product actually goes back up the needle, the path of least resistance. Uh, so that's why uh, actually cannulas are more accurate because they don't have that phenomenon. So let's go into calcium hydroxyapatite. Um, it's gonna be very white, hyperechoic. And you sometimes can see small white spheres. Posterior to it, you have something called posterior shadowing. So both uh, posterior enhancement and posterior shadowing are called artifacts, and they're not actual anatomic findings, but they help you to identify the filler if you have some questions about it. I'm also going to show you some hyperdilute calcium hydroxyapatite. So this is a temple. And remember, when you're looking at an image, the skin is up here, and this would be the bone. This is the deep aspect of the image. This would be the temporal bone. So right here is the deep temporal artery. And this was injected with that one up, one over gunshot technique that is very popular. But I want to warn you that Sometimes the filler that is placed is actually very close to that deep temporal artery. As you can see in this video, video here, um, there's some calcium hydroxyapatite right in this area. Okay. So What's that, the scale there in terms of that distance between the, the deposit and the artery? I actually cut that out, but um, thank you for asking. It's about 1.5 centimeters. Okay. Um, So I just wanted to show you some other examples of injecting the Kaha uh, on the left side is uh, onto the mandible in, and you can see that it's in the masseter. So the masseter uh, runs from here to here. This is the masseter muscle. That's what a muscle looks like. But on the right side, you can see the calcium hydroxyapatite injected onto the chin. Okay. so. So you have to know what these fillers look like in order to determine if there's pathology or not. So this is hyperdilute Kaha, which uh, I actually often do. So you uh, mix the filler with saline and lidocaine, sometimes in a four to one, two to one, six to one dilution. And you see right here, you inject it, uh, in, in most cases, you inject it just subdermally and this is a cloudiness you see with hyperdilute Kaha. So this is an interesting uh, study I did. Um, I'm gonna write this up as well. Um, so what the arrow is showing is the platysma muscle. This was injected calcium hydroxyapatite hyperdilute into the neck. And on the left side, you can see the distance uh, between the skin and the platysma was about 1.6, 1.7 millimeters. On the right side, after three months, two treatments, you can see that that distance significantly increased to 3.3 millimeters. So you had a significant improvement 
in the skin thickness there. So PMMA, not many people use it, but uh, you will see it in your practice. It's gonna be hyperechoic as well, which means white, but they have a little different artifact. I sometimes see this comet tail. I also sometimes see posterior shadowing. Okay, so here we have PMMA right here and we have the comet tail artifact behind it. So it looks kind of like Halley's Comet. This is an area in, in um, lower chin area. And so you see the DAO muscle and you see the mental foramen as well. Typically that's a, a constant relationship where the mental foramen is, is behind the DAO muscle. And the DLI muscle is actually gonna be slightly deeper than the DAO and more medial. So medial is over on this side. PLLA, uh, very often used. It uh, has a large component of water. So it actually is a diffuse type of product. So you often see a clouding of white. Okay, it's also gonna be hyperechoic. So here you see uh, PLLA right here and right here. I'm gonna go through some pathologies in the near future. Silicone oil, I hope none of you are injecting it, but you will see patients with this. Um, it's very ill-defined, hyperechoic, diffuse image. What you have to know about silicone oil, it looks like a snowstorm. You can't forget it once I show you it. So this is what a snowstorm looks like. Um, on the left, you, you, you totally obliterate the uh, anatomy that's deep to it. On the right side was a patient who was injected in the gabella area. Um, and uh, you can't see any of the anatomy either. <clears throat> this is just an example of something I do use the ultrasound frequently for, and it's looking for dermal thickness. And I wanna show you the different layers of the dermis have different echogenicities. So the epidermis is gonna be very hyperechoic. It's gonna be white. The papillary dermis has a lot of blood in it, so it's gonna be darker. And then the reticular dermis, which is right here, is going to be uh, filled with collagen and elastin. So it's going to have a little bit of a, a white uh, echo to it. And then the subcutaneous fat is going to be uh, all types of different uh, echo. It could be uh, very dark black. It could be light uh, gray as well. It, it just depends on its collagen content. I will often look at the vasculature of the temple. Uh, prior to injections. And what you can see here is the superficial temporal artery, and you also see the deep temporal artery. The deep temporal artery runs along that periosteum. And then you can also see the middle temporal vein in the intermediate temporal fat. The intermediate temporal fat is bounded here by the deep temporal fascia. Uh, this is the deep lamina, and this is a superficial lamina. What I'm gonna show you next is a very, uh, is something I just did this past weekend for ASAPs. And so this is a superficial temporal artery that was injected immediately before, uh, I'm sorry, the temple was in, injected immediately prior. This patient was injected in the temple. She was injected in the temple with Sculptra in the interfascial plane and uh, with an HA product uh, one up, one over onto the periosteum. So what you're seeing with the arrow right now is the deep injection onto the periosteum of, with an HA. So what I'm showing you is a superficial temporal artery. And then I'm gonna show you that deep injection onto the periosteum of HA. Now I'm gonna show you the scope drug, which is injected into the interfascial plane between the SMAS and the deep temporal fascia. Now I'm showing you the prezygomatic space, okay? And I'm gonna show you the HA that was injected below the SMAS, and I'm gonna show you. So this is HA product uh, injected below the SMAS, and that's the SMAS right there. And this little highlight uh, can be, uh, it was added to the new uh, software. So now this is HA product that is superficial to the SMAS, in the cheek area, okay? So this is a great learning tool when you can highlight things. So now what I'm doing is I'm looking in uh, the nasal labial fold, and I'm showing you injections of that with HA. You see the posterior enhancement, 
And here's the HA product in the nasal labial fold. And now I'm going to show you a, a chin injection in the marionette area. I'm sorry. And um, I'm going to show you the difference of what a muscle looks like and the HA product. So this is the DAO muscle. And you see it's a little bit lighter shade of gray. And then this is an HA product injected into the marionette. And then below the DAO muscle is often something called the labial mental artery. Oh, this is a posterior enhancement, proving that it's the HA product. And then over here on the right, you're gonna see the, um, right here, that is the uh, labial mental artery. So now I'm looking at a lip injection done just prior. And what you're gonna see, I'm gonna highlight some filler and then I'm gonna hide. So this is the HA filler and that is the uh, superior labial artery. That's the HA filler right there, okay? So now let's go to the next slide. We're, let's talk about some complications. So this is PLLA nodule, but you see it's kind of black. It's not what you would expect. So this is actually the methylcellulose causing the nodule and not the PLLA. Methylcellulose is a carrier in Sculptra. So this is another nodule, but it's actually a combination of the uh, PLLA and the methylcellulose. So this is a calcium hydroxyapatite nodule, and you can see the accumulation of product near the skin, and then you can see the posterior shadowing related to that nodule. Shadowing means you cannot see beyond the nodule because the ultrasound sound wave is blocked by that nodule. So what do I typically see in an HA nodule from a regular uh, HA uh, pocket? They're, the aggregates of the filler are usually larger than you typically see. They're usually a little more rounded and they often have more posterior enhancement than a typical HA pocket. And the thing to remember is, is that these HA uh, nodules can often be encapsulated and they often require ultrasound guidance to, uh, to, to get rid of them. If you don't, there's often a poor success rate because this capsule does not allow the hyaluronidase to enter it. So what I wanna show you here is this patient had some malar edema. And what you look for in malar edema is sometimes associated with HA product that is superficial to that SNAS. So when I say malar edema, swelling around the uh, infraorbital area, usually a little bit laterally. So this is a SNAS. And right here, you see the HA product that is above the SNAS. So the HA product that is above the SNAS often will cause malar edema. And these will often need to be dissolved. There's also HA product below this mass, but this often will not cause the malar edema. It's the superficial HA product. So this patient came to me with severe Tyndall, which is a blue effect underneath her eye. And this was caused by filler that was injected 10 years prior. She thought that she was just gaining weight and this was a sign of old age. And she had no idea that this was caused by the filler because it was so long prior. So you see the, um, Tyndall effect right here. It looks kind of blue. So after two treatments, she came back to normal with hyaluronidase. And I'm going to show you what the ultrasound finding is. So the ultrasound finding shows a significant collection of HA product superficial to that orbicularis oculi muscle, which is kind of even hard to see here. And then on the right side, you see the the typical obicularis oculi muscle without the accumulation of the product. So this is actually me with my PA injecting a nodule in my tear trough area. And you can see her entering that nodule with a cannula. And if you look at it closely, that nodule will almost instantaneously disappear when she injects the hyaluronidase but you have to enter that capsule to get the best effect. And so she's using the ultrasound guidance to do that. 
And then you're going to see in an injection in a split second how it basically melts before your eyes and goes away. Now, there's another one uh, that she does similar, but I want to show you what the befores and afters look like. So here's the HJ pocket. And then here it is 24 hours later, completely resolved under ultrasound guidance. So in summary, ultrasound is extremely valuable in identifying fillers and their complications. Uh, nodules, Tyndall effect, granulomas, swelling can all be evaluated using ultrasound. I wanna stress that oftentimes the HA uh, nodules are encapsulated and that's why people have been injected three, four or five times and they still have that nodule. So ultrasound is actually very valuable in trying to get that needle or cannula inside that nodule. And obviously it's uh, probably the gold standard now for treating vascular occlusions. And Dr. Stella is gonna explain that in, in the next presentation. Great, thanks so much, Dr. Weiner. If you have questions uh, for Dr. Weiner, please put them in the Q&A and we're gonna have time at the end to circle back on that after our demo and wrapping up the webinar. But before we get there, we wanna introduce the second half of our webinar, which is specifically on vascular occlusions. And we can't think of anyone better for that than Dr. Stella Desyadnikova, who is a double board certified facial plastic and reconstructive surgeon and director of aesthetics at the Stella Center in Seattle, Washington. She graduated from University of Washington School of Medicine with honors and completed her residency in otolaryngology, head and neck surgery at the Oregon Health Sciences University and fellowship in facial plastic and reconstructive surgery at University of Washington. She's been in practice for 18 years, specializing in all aspects of facial aesthetic procedures with an emphasis on facial injectables and non-surgical rhinoplasty. She's a trainer for ultrasound and injectable safety in the US and internationally, a guru for Ravance Aesthetics and a member of the internal expert forward for CMAC. She is the first physician in the United States to reverse a vascular occlusion using ultrasound and is committed to expanding education and awareness of ultrasound use to optimize safety of aesthetic procedures. Welcome, Dr. Desyatnikova. Hi, uh, good afternoon and welcome everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Frankel, for the introduction. I'm very excited to be here. And what a great presentation, Dr. Weiner. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm Dr. Stella Desyatnikova from Seattle, Washington. I'm a facial plastic surgeon, and uh, it is truly an honor to be here today uh, and uh, talk to you guys about the treatment of vascular occlusion using ultrasound. I would like to thank Clarice for extending the invitation and for allowing uh, me to be here and share our results. Um, so uh, let's just start. So uh, since we all find ourselves here, uh, I'm sure that you know that ultrasound and aesthetics, it's not a new concept. Uh, and you also know that it uh, recently has gone from a fairly obscure uh, little concept in aesthetics to uh, pretty much becoming a gold standard for our treatments. And what is behind this surge in popularity? And it's several factors. First of all, the devices have improved tremendously. Uh, they are, uh, we have a lot of portable devices. The price has come down, so they're affordable for smaller practices. And the quality of the imaging has improved significantly. And uh, the most important thing now is that the practitioners really want to optimize the safety of their treatments. And that's why we're all here. So of course, uh, talking of safety, vascular occlusion is on everyone's mind. And vascular occlusion and particular blindness, it's one of the most dreaded complications of filler injections. There are millions of fill injections that are done every year. And uh, like Dr. Frankel said initially, uh, the true incidence of occlusion is really unknown because it probably goes underreported most of the time. One of the recent publications in the JAMA Dermatology found that uh, among the board certified dermatologists, uh, about uh, one third to a half injectors had at least one occlusion in the preceding 10 years and probably the true incidence is much higher than that. Uh, of course, we all have the protocol to deal with occlusions and uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the Delorenzi protocol and uh, injections of high dose hyaluronidase. 
pulse treatment until the restoration of vascular flow. And most of the time it works. However, uh, it comes at quite a price and the price is uh, literally price. The uh, injections are expensive. The material hyaluronidase is expensive, uh, but it's also a price to our patient's psyche. There's anxiety, there's pain, there's a lot of injections, there's uncertainty about the outcome. So in the end, we kind of have to decide, uh, is this the best way to do it or is there a better way? So imagine the situation. This is uh, the first patient that uh, uh, I have encountered using ultrasound in my practice uh, with occlusion. Uh, this patient had an injection of um, lip filler, one syringe, tiny amount to the chin, uh, and uh, her injector noticed an occlusion uh, soon afterwards with symptoms of uh, a decreased capillary refill. Uh, and uh, they started injecting hyaluronidase, and they were injecting, injecting, and following the protocol. And many hours later, they stayed up all night, injected 28 vials, uh, the patient had uh, still persistent occlusion symptoms. So if you encountered with a uh, case like this in your practice, do you think you can fix it? What would you do? So now uh, I can tell you that you can fix it. And uh, let me introduce you to the concept of using ultrasound for treatment of vascular occlusion complications. So use of ultrasound for vascular occlusion has been described initially by Dr. Schelke from the Amsterdam Cutaneous Group. They have a large complication clinic and they have been doing this for years. So what I want to do in this presentation today is go over the basic steps and introduce you to something that you can do in your practice if you ever find yourself in this situation. Um, so let's just kind of go through the basics. This is not going to become, uh, make you an expert, uh, but I think this can be very helpful for uh, your patient management. So there are some steps. First of all, of course you do the clinical examination uh, and you establish the extent of the occlusion. And that's the uh, skin markings, lividoid markings on the skin, decreased capillary refill, um, sometimes it will be a uh, persistent paleness. Uh, and then once you establish this clinical area, then you bring in your ultrasound and then you do the vascular mapping with ultrasound in all the areas of the abnormal flow. Uh, and then uh, you look for normal flow, abnormal flow in the area of the clinical occlusion uh, and around, because you also need to check out the tributaries of this uh, arteries and veins. Then once you identify the areas of abnormal flow, uh, which I will show you uh, in a minute, then you look for filler. And once you find the filler in those areas, then you can dissolve that filler, ultrasound guided, uh, and you can dissolve it with very small and targeted amounts of hyaluronidase. Um, and then you can check the blood flow again with ultrasound fairly soon after in the next several minutes. Uh, and usually if the occlusion is reversed, the flow returns back very fast and you can watch it return basically in front of your eyes over the next several minutes. And the most important thing to do is document, document, document. Make sure that you document everything with imaging and with your notes. So step one is a clinical exam. You examine the patient, uh, like I said, the lividoid skin marking, uh, marble discolorations, persistent areas of paleness. You check the capillary refill, uh, look if it's normal, abnormal, delayed. In this patient, we had two areas uh, of uh, markedly decreased capillary refill, and it was in the right lower lip and the right peripheral. So then what we do, uh, we brought our ultrasound uh, and we do the vascular mapping. And obviously you have to know the anatomy, you have to know the vessels, you have to know what you will be looking for. Uh, for example, in this case, you're looking for facial artery and angular artery and superior and inferior labial artery and all the arteries in the chin, mental, submental. So you look for those 
and what we found in this patient is uh, that there were some areas of uh, what looked like abnormal flow. And uh, we were very fortunate in this case that we were able to establish a connection with Dr. Shelke herself uh, virtually. And she helped us confirm where the flow was abnormal and where there was uh, the filler blocking this flow. So uh, we marked it on the skin and I will tell you a little bit later about the marking, but this is basically where there was abnormal flow. You can see this little red uh, pen markings. So here's one area of the abnormal flow and of the filler. And what you see here, there's a, a little bit of the uh, perfusion that you see, but the main artery is missing. And you see the collaterals that are trying to perfuse this area with a block flow. And also you see this area of the filler and uh, here's my pointer. So here's uh, this area of uh, lucidity. Uh, and the exam, the ultrasound exam can be very difficult uh, after multiple injections of hyaluronidase because the area is swollen, it is bruised, so it might not be quite very uh, cut and dry, uh, but still you're able to visualize the uh, filler deposits, uh, which in this area was kind of right around this area of abnormal blood flow. And we found those two areas which was lateral to the modiolus and in the right lateral chin. And then uh, that's when uh, it turned out that there was actually a little bit of a filler injection injected in the chin as well. So then once you have those confirmed, you can do the ultrasound guided injections of hyaluronidase. And we used very small injections. Um, I used about half a vial uh, and we started with the chin because it seemed uh, to be uh, uh, just basically an easier area to inject. So, and once we injected the chin, suddenly we saw improvement in the flow in the chin area uh, and also in the area uh, lateral to the modiolus. And uh, as we repeated the ultrasound exam, that's what we saw. We saw improvement of the flow in the artery, which was probably the submental artery uh, and the right facial artery. So, uh, what was happening though, the patient still had delayed capillary refill at the piriform. So we added another uh, half a vial or 75 units of hyaluronidase in that area. Uh, and that led to complete resolution of her symptoms other than some bruising. So here are some uh, images uh, on your uh, left. Uh, you can see the area of decreased flow and uh, Here's a needle, and that was early in my uh, ultrasound occlusion career. So the image is not the best, but you can see uh, some reverberation artifact from the needle um, that we were trying to inject the hyaluronidase in the deposits of the filler. And on your right, uh, you can see a very well restored submental area over the chin, and here's a chin bone. Um, and that is a normal, beautiful uh, flow in the artery. Dr. Stowe, it's worth emphasizing maybe, you know, these for new users, these arteries are very small structures and to be able to know that the flow returned really requires what we were discussing earlier, knowledge of the anatomy beforehand, before you see the occlusion of what it should look like. Uh, so you can identify what's absent from the vision, right? Absolutely. And that can be the hardest point. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll talk about that some more. Uh, but uh, yeah, you absolutely, you have to know the anatomy, you have to know uh, what to look for, uh, even though the artery is a variable, but you still kind of have to have an idea where they can be and where those variations are. And that is very important because indeed those arteries are tiny, uh, but you can really see the return of the blood flow. It is really quite remarkable. So what we learned from this case, uh, first of all, um, and there are some practical points that I want you to take home, uh, that some of these cases can take a long time uh, unless you're an expert like Dr. Shelke and her group. Um, it can take a while and vascular mapping can take a while. Uh, in the meanwhile, your devices may heat up and your battery may run out. 
And this is where that marking comes up. You saw those little markings before, because when you have to come back after your uh, device is no longer warm or you switch the battery, it helps you remember where you were before so you don't have to start all over again. And it's good to be prepared for that. So you can have extra batteries. Uh, we have several batteries in clinic. And uh, if you can have a fan, add a fan that helps to decrease the rate of heating the device. So, uh, and another point that I wanted you to take, if you ever deal with that, and if you don't know how to do the ultrasound guided injections, just look for all the filler in that area and try to dissolve it. And this is probably will be the most important for you as you start. And you might be not quite confident in what you do with your ultrasound. Uh, and another thing that uh, once the flow is normal, that really means that the occlusion is reversed and you can send the patient home. It's very reassuring, but make sure that you check the patient the next day because they may develop some additional areas of occlusion uh, as you will see later. So this was our second case. Uh, and uh, in this case, it was a needle injection to the piriform. Uh, with immediate symptoms of occlusion, uh, blanching, um, lividoid markings, uh, and was treated by her injector and another provider over two days, and they injected 49 vials of hyaluronidase uh, to that area and to all the tributary uh, arterial areas. Uh, and they had some improvement, but still was not a complete resolution. So um, after we all talked and the patient agreed to come to Seattle, uh, and again, we're fortunate uh, to be able to communicate with Dr. Schelke, who really is the godmother of aesthetic ultrasound, uh, as I call her, uh, and uh, treating all the complications. So we did all the uh, vascular mapping, uh, which might take a while because this was a huge area of occlusion. And in her case, it involved her cheek, uh, her lip, her nose, uh, and uh, that was... Um, the day uh, two after the initial injection. So we found a couple of areas where the blood flow was decreased and looked like it was abnormal. Uh, and we injected two small amount of hyaluronidase in those areas. And I'll show to you in a second where it was. And then uh, after uh, it seems like uh, her symptoms were resolved, again, remember you have to see the patient the next day. And I will show you what happened the next day. So these were the two areas uh, where there was still persistent occlusion despite 49 vials that were injected all around that area. And those are the areas where we had small targeted injections of hyaluronidase. So here are some uh, abnormal flow and normal flow after dissolving. And this is the angular artery area. And on your left, you see some small tributaries uh, or collaterals that are trying to diffuse that area. Uh, and on your uh, right, you see that there is a um, basically normal flow and you can see good flow in the angular artery uh, after using our small uh, ultrasound guided injections of hyaluronidase. And this is the uh, area of the lateral nasal artery. Uh, and that was still significant, uh, significantly symptomatic for her. Uh, and uh, we did not inject hyaluronidase so there, as you saw on the image, but this is what we saw initially. We saw uh, poor flow, and after uh, injections of hyaluronidase, we saw a return of uh, the good arterial flow and good image of the lateral nasal artery. So when we saw her the next day, uh, all those areas were okay. And what you see in the video, this is the blood flow in the glabella, and she had new symptoms of the uh, lividoid skin markings that spread over her forehead and the glabella and actually the contralateral cheek as well. And once we did the mapping, we saw that there was seen to be a blockage in her uh, glabella. And uh, you can see on the video that after injected with glabella and blood flow returned, uh, fairly robust flow, fairly uh, fast. And then uh, we discharged her and she did very well with no residual sequela. 
So uh, what I want to leave you with was several considerations that first of all, like the second case show, vascular occlusion is not an emergency, unless of course it is blindness, which is an emergency. Uh, but otherwise you have up to three days before irreversible changes occur. Uh, and you can really take your time and do your treatment. And if you, the occlusion is indeed reversed, you can see the flow coming back with an ultrasound very quickly. So make sure to see your patient the next day because new areas of ischemia may declare themselves overnight and you may need to treat them. And again, be prepared. Portable devices can get heated, uh, can run out of battery. Uh, make sure that you're prepared for that. And the most important thing is that having a device is not to get out of jail card. I see a lot of people who are getting the devices now and then they put it in a box and they say, this is my emergency box. I'm gonna take it out if I have a vascular occlusion ever. And this is absolutely exactly what you don't want to do. If you never use this ultrasound and if you haven't used it every day for a long time, you're not gonna know what to do. In a special case of emergency, emotions run very high. So make sure that you're prepared. Uh, make sure that you know what the normal blood flow looks like. Make sure that you know your anatomy always correlate clinically. Uh, and uh, yeah, you will go through this learning curve once you get your device that can be steep initially, especially if you have never used ultrasound before. And this is where training can be immensely helpful. And we all do training. Dr. Uh, Weiner does the training. I do the training. Uh, Dr. Shelke does the training in Europe and actually coming to Seattle to do the training with us. So make sure that you do the training and you practice. Uh, you practice all the time so that when that emergency strikes, you're prepared and you not only know what to do, but it becomes more of a second nature to you. So in conclusion, uh, ultrasound is uh, a great, great uh, option for us. Uh, and it's a great option to treat the occlusions. Uh, and it's even better used to prevent the occlusions so that you know where the vessels are and you can avoid them with your injections. It does give us a really unprecedented amount of information for our treatments um, in terms of vascular anatomy, in terms of anatomy, in terms of all the prior treatments, uh, prior fillers, surgery, uh, and the learning curve that some people dread can be greatly improved with training and practice. So be prepared, practice, with your devices, it's really fun to use them and uh, make sure that you're prepared. And I hope you never have to encounter those complications, but if you do, uh, I think you will do well. Those are basic steps. Thank you so much. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Dr. Stella, for an uh, amazing presentation. Uh, and we're gonna hand it back to Janice to take it home in just a minute here, but I wanted to do a quick demo uh, is one of my favorite parts of these webinars, which is um, maybe we'll invite Dr. Weiner back and we have a live model. I'm not used to doing uh, dermal filler scans. I've done a lot of scans uh, for other indications, but this is outside of my normal toolbox. But uh, I, if you could maybe talk me through what I would be looking for to try and identify some of the fillers here. So um, maybe we can start up here on the, on the, sure. uh, the nasolabial fold, or should we go up higher? Um, let's go to nasal labial fold. That that showed okay. up pretty good. Um, I would. So we're gonna. Would, am I gonna angle in the nasal labial fold, or how should I angle it? Turn, here? turn it that 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 way. I like. We we were able. Yeah. Okay. Great. And I'm gonna bring the depth down a little bit. So I want to see kind of the bone at the bottom of the screen here. Yeah. Right. Okay. Am I on? And I'm on dermatology setting. You like that one? Yeah. You could use dermatology or MSK. Um, okay. The MSK can get a little deeper, uh, but derm can go around too. But over okay. here on the upper right, you can see the filler. Right here. Yeah. Yeah, I see the hypoechoic structures here, pretty well demarcated. And I right. thought I saw a hint of the uh, angular artery too. Yeah, a little bit to the left of that. Yeah, that circular structure. I, yeah, right, right there, I think. You can confirm you that with the uh, color Doppler. I'm putting on Doppler, so I'm gonna fire on. I like power Doppler. I don't really care about the positional. There we go. It's 
scoot it a little more to the right, the box. The box. I moved in my transducer too. Okay. <laughs> well, there you go. So when you inject this, um, this, I, I wasn't the injector, but when you inject in the nasal labial, um, you can inject it deeply or you can inject it superficially. And this patient was injected superficially, uh, superficial to the artery and the SMAS. Should we do one more look here? Maybe. Um... Yeah, so there's the SMAS. It left, it's kind of a linear structure that goes like uh, left to right. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. It's superficial in the screen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. okay, and up here, what am I looking at? So I've got the bone down below. Yeah, you might actually be near the um, infraorbital foramen along the, the bone there. Um, so below the SMAS would be your deep medial cheek fat. And uh, there's this, that would be the SMAS. And then above the SMAS would be your superficial fat. And really as I was saying in my demonstration um, that the fat could actually have a lot of different echoes. The deep fat and the superficial fat um, actually have much different echoes. The deep fat in this uh, area, you see it's uh, pretty dark black, but the superficial fat is a lighter gray. Um, and that, that, that's clinically relevant uh, when we're in the anatomy lab too, the, the, the fat is different. Now you're in the tear trough. Whoop, right. over there on yeah. the upper left is the tear trough and you can see um, the orbicularis oculi as well. Um, the um, black linear structure is orbicularis oculi. And then over on the very left is your tear trough. And you see there's not much room to place filler there. And we often do, but there's bone, there's orbicularis oculi, and then there's skin. Yeah, I mean, this depth is just millimeters here. It's pretty right. amazing to get resolution. Right. The, the transducers I always trained on and we're used to using, we could never see this kind of resolution on the millimeter, submillimeter scale. So. It always kind of blows me away, these microstructures that you can visualize here. So in this area, the deep fat would be the medial souf. Okay. Um, right. And right there, that's the angular artery. Right there. In, in the medial yeah. canthal area. Yeah, great. Well, yeah. thanks for that. You know, it always highlights um, one of the really cool things. I, and Dr. Stella talking about using um, teleradiology with these handheld devices and screen share and the power of Zoom really makes even um, getting consultation and help pretty easy too and guidance in doing, you know, that's what that's about what my second uh, filler scan and able to identify fillers with you remotely, you know, thousands of miles away. It's pretty awesome. Um, so let's let uh, Janez take it home here and then we will save some time to jump back into Q&A. We have so many questions. We'll try to do our best to get to them. Thank you, Dr. Frankel and Dr. Weiner and Dr. Desyatnikova. Uh, we do have dozens of questions that we'll get to very shortly. Just before we start our live Q&A, I would like to take a minute to introduce you to the Clarius L20HD, the world's first and only high frequency ultrasound scanner in a 20 megahertz uh, capability. Now we're just gonna pull up a poll in case you'd like some more information on this scanner. Um, and again, select anything that you would like here. We are available in 90 countries. And so if you'd like local pricing and availability, we'd be happy to do that for you. Um, if you'd like to um, schedule, speak to one of our experts about the advantages of wireless ultrasound, we'd be happy to have someone uh, chat with you about that. If you'd like to book a live demo, we can do that as well. Um, again, that is a one-on-one -on -one live demo using Zoom. If you'd like to discuss features, we can do that and we can certainly make more video tutorials available to you. Now, while you're just completing the poll, I'm gonna chat a little bit um, about the Claris L20. Um, so since the 80s, ultrasound has been the recognized gold standard amongst plastic surgeons, but systems are costly and complex. Today, Claris ultrasound is changing the game in facial aesthetics. Miniaturization and innovation with handheld units mean higher definition imaging is now easy and affordable with image quality that rivals traditional systems, but just at a fraction of the cost, representing well over 80% savings. The Claris L20 HD is the only handheld ultrasound with ultra high frequency to 20 megahertz for exceptional superficial imaging to four centimeters. 
It's the leading choice for plastic surgeons, dermatologists, nurse practitioners, and medical estheticians. With its best-in-class high-definition imaging of the skin, muscles, vessels, and fascia, you'll gain confidence in your needle placement, accurately evaluate fillers, and more easily treat complications, improving patient safety. And the secret lies in each scanner with eight beam formers and 192 elements that deliver the crystal clear image only found in traditional systems. Artificial intelligence replaces those complex knobs and buttons, making ultrasound imaging fast and so much easier to use. Claris is also wireless, freeing up space with zero footprint. It's fully immersible and so much faster to clean and disinfect as well. Only Claris delivers linear wireless scanners with free ecosystem that includes free apps for your iOS and Android devices with free updates and unlimited cloud storage to capture and manage exams. And we now have a new Claris two-in-one charging station that allows you to charge, grab, and go while also charging a secondary battery. Um, and then along with the fan, you can uh, keep your unit cool. And this means you'll also have the continuous power supply you need when you need it most. So we're just gonna close the poll and we're actually now gonna start a live Q&A uh, session. So I'd like to welcome back Dr. Desietnikova and Dr. Weiner for our live Q&A session. Please use the questions icon in the menu bar to ask your questions of our great doctors. We've got dozens of questions now. So I think what we'll do if we can is just go a little bit over time to answer as many as we can. Dr. Frankel, if you would moderate our session, please. Yeah, I'd be happy to, and I'll jump back in. Again, we'll get to whoever, uh, we'll, we'll follow up with whoever we can answer. Uh, first question, I am trying to get, glom them together, is do you do, I think I know the answer, um, pre-procedural mapping, and how routinely do you use the device to do that for vascular mapping specifically? So the answer is yes, vascular mapping. Uh, I don't do it 100% of the time. Uh, I probably do it uh, about 50% of the time and for high-risk areas. 100% of the time. I do a lot of uh, nose injections. Uh, I do uh, mapping before, during injections, and after the injections to confirm the filler placement. I, I think that um, you don't need to do it for every patient every time. The high-risk areas, as uh, Stella discussed, the nose, the temple, the piriform, um, and if you inject the gabella, or the forehead, you should be doing it there. But um, if you um, have learned the correct planes for the cheek and the jawline and the chin, you you probably don't need to do it there. Great. Um, a lot of people want to know, you know, not just where they can find training, which you guys um, discussed a little bit, but what is the learning curve exactly? Like, how long does it take? How many scans? Uh, before someone can feel proficient, highly, uh, I guess for different applications, it would be different. I'm still learning. Um, I've been doing it over two years. I'm um, still learning. And I'm refining my technique, but I think that if you attend one of our training classes with us sort of looking over your shoulder and helping you with the um, manipulation of the uh, image, uh, you could, you could learn enough that you could start doing it at home and in your practice. Um, now, you probably won't immediately be able to take care of a complication, but again, there's help around that, that we can do telemedicine and so forth. But you should be imaging everything you possibly can, your family, yourself, your patients, before, after injections, to just get familiar with what it looks like. Um, and it takes a while initially, but it's really, really important to practice. So what I always tell people is just uh, use it as much as you can and uh, maybe look a little bit. With every patient, you can look for a couple of minutes. Uh, you can look here, you can look there. Maybe you haven't found the artery, but you're kind of getting the hang of it and then you're getting better. Uh, and then suddenly in uh, three or four days, suddenly everything uh, becomes much clearer in that area. Um, it's really important to practice. You really cannot just keep that devices uh, kind of in the drawer and use them in emergency. So focusing on treatments, I wanna try and squeeze in a couple more questions here. Um, I'm gonna combine a bunch together. So do you inject directly intra-arterial with the high alluronidase when you're dealing with a vascular occlusion 
And do you do it under live ultrasound guidance or kind of secondary with uh, just sort of mapping the area? So I think uh, honestly, sometimes we don't know because those arteries are so small and sometimes our patients, you know, everything is swollen and bruised. Uh, and theoretically, uh, you try to inject interarterial. Uh, practically, uh, I honestly, I think we don't know, uh, especially when you're just starting. You look for areas of the filler, you dissolve it. Uh, you look for reestablishment of the flow. Yeah. I, I, um, I'll give you my two cents. I think that extra luminal hyaluronidase is very inefficient at going through a blood vessel. Um, and I do believe that most of the occlusions uh, are, are, almost all occlusions are related to intervascular HA. And um, so you really need to get inside the vessel to get the best result. Now, there is, uh, De Lorenze floods the area and over time, some of that does go through the vessel wall, but um, when you're in the vessel, you're gonna be much more efficient with your hyaluronidase. Um, so, uh, an external compression with the filler, uh, I don't believe to be a ma major problem except within the nose, um, in the nasal tip. So to take this a little further, because there are a lot of questions about this too, is if you can't find that focal area like you showed us, Dr. Stella, how about injecting proximally where you can find artery uh, to make sure it goes intravascular? Is that sort of fringe or accepted technique or what, what's your take on that? I actually think that's not ideal. Um, I know some people do that. Uh, and uh, you know, I think initially when I was thinking about using ultrasound for blindness, I was thinking about just finding the vessels and trying to inject superorbital, supertrochlear, temporal, all the vessels that can potentially connect to the retinal arteries. Uh, but I think what you really want to do, uh, examine patient clinically, uh, I would inject uh, in the areas where you see the decreased flow in ultrasound. Uh, any filler deposits that you can find on ultrasound, inject there. Uh, not proximally, but inject there. Try to remove all the filler. Uh, and again, you know, we have discussed that with Dr. Schelke. Again, it's, it's harder for people when people just start. So just try to remove all the filler around there. Uh, and if there are still areas of decreased capillary refill, I would inject there as well. Um, I agree with that. I there's something called a choke uh, phenomenon. And what choke is, is that um, the body tries to protect um, surrounding structures when it's under stress. And um, if there's an area of occlusion, other areas clamp down their flow. And so it's conceivable, particularly in blindness, that the flow to the eye is uh, clamped down, not related to an embolus, but related to this choke phenomenon. So you need to clear the initial area of the vascular occlusion, and perhaps, hopefully, that choke will open up and the vision will return. So totally agree with that. Um, if you inject into an artery, and this has been shown in a couple of cases, um, far removed from the occlusion, you can push by embolic phenomenon that HA further into the system and cause more trouble. So it's much better to get it in the exact location. It, but, if, but if push comes to shove and you're not getting anywhere, particularly in the eye, uh, I do think that you should at least try um, to do it in the supertrocher and superorbital it, because you only have about 15 minutes. I also want to mention, since you brought up the choke uh, anastomosis phenomenon, that one of the mechanisms of hyaluronidase action is the release of nitric oxide, which can help to relieve the spasm in the vessels. And I think it's not just direct dissolving of the filler, but it's also relieving of the spasm. That's what happens with hyaluronidase. And actually ultrasound itself has been found to uh, release the nitric oxide. So I think it can act uh, synergistically with hyaluronidase and help relieve the spasm in the anastomotic vessels. And I think that can be an additional 
a supporting factor in our treatment. Great. I want to be respectful of everyone's time, uh, so maybe we will wrap it up there, Janez, and uh, we'll, we'll certainly follow up with all the questions afterward. Absolutely. If we didn't get to your question, we will follow up by email in the coming week. You'll all receive a copy of the slides and webinar recording, so do keep an eye on your inbox with links to those resources. Um, and please, as well, complete our closing survey to provide your feedback so that we can bring you more educational webinars like today. To conclude, I would like to thank Dr. Desyatnikova and Dr. Weiner and Dr. Frankel for all of their insights and a very big thank you to all of you for joining us today. Have a wonderful day and keep scanning. Thank you. Thank you so Great. much. Bye-bye, thank you. Bye.